Hello and welcome to Drugs Plus. Whether you're here for exam revision or just general interest, I hope you find this video useful. If you do, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to support this channel so that I'm able to continue creating this content. In this video, I'm going to introduce a series of videos all about cardiovascular pharmacology. In order to set the scene, I'm going to explain the process of cardiac excitation contraction coupling the way that cardiac cells convert electrical energy into kinetic energy. So, cardiac excitation is triggered by the sinoatrial node in the wall of the right atrium. At the start of the cycle, the SA node cardiomyocytes are at rest, meaning their sodium channels are closed and the membrane potential is around minus 90 millivolts. However, some sodium does leak into the cell via gap junctions. When this sodium influx depolarizes the cell membrane sufficiently at around minus 70 millivolts, voltage-gated sodium channels open, causing a marked influx of sodium. When the cell depolarizes to around plus 20 millivolts, voltage-gated sodium channels close and voltage-gated potassium channels open. This causes a potassium efflux but when the membrane becomes repolarized to around plus 5 millivolts, voltage-gated calcium channels open too. This is a vital stage, as this calcium is what causes the cells, and therefore the heart, to contract. So, as calcium influx and potassium efflux are occurring simultaneously, the membrane potential plateaus. However, the calcium channels quickly close and the potassium channels remain open facilitating membrane repolarization. When the original membrane potential of minus 90 millivolts is reached, potassium channels close and the cycle is repeated. Now, looking closer at the cardiomyocytes, these cells have multiple invaginations known as T-tubules, which are packed with calcium channels in order to bring the calcium closer to the contractile machinery within the cell. So to go over the excitation cycle again, some sodium enters the cell via gap junctions. This causes voltage-gated sodium channels to open, causing sodium influx. When this reaches plus 20 millivolts, the potassium channels open and sodium channels close, causing potassium efflux. Here, calcium channels also open, causing calcium influx and these then close and the potassium channels remain open causing repolarization. The potassium channels then close and the process is repeated. So, when the calcium enters the cardiomyocytes from the T-tubules, this is known as a calcium spark. This calcium binds to ryanodine receptors on sarcoplasmic reticula causing the channels to open, facilitating calcium influx into the cytosol, a calcium sparklet. This process is known as calcium-induced calcium release and provides sufficient calcium to contract the cell. So, onto the contractile machinery. When cardiomyocytes are relaxed, tropomyosin strands, the yellow strand here, wind around actin strands, blocking their myosin binding sites. However, upon calcium entry, calcium binds to troponin C molecules, which induces conformational changes in the tropomyosin strands to which they are attached. This pulls the tropomyosin away, thus exposing the myosin binding sites on actin strands. This allows myosin heads to bind to actin, forming a cross bridge. The ATP molecule to which the myosin head is attached becomes hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate. This provides the energy for the rotation of the myosin head, producing the power stroke. At this point, ATP reassociates to the head, causing it to return to its original conformation before new cross bridges are formed and the process is repeated, causing the cell to contract. However, just as important as excitation contraction coupling is de-excitation relaxation coupling. After contraction, calcium is no longer entering the cell as the cell becomes repolarized. The majority of the calcium 
is transported back into the cytoplasmic reticulum via circuit 2A channels. Additionally, some calcium is also extruded from the cell in exchange for sodium ions via NCX channels, and some is transported into mitochondria for use in metabolic processes. This means no calcium will be available to pull the tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites, so contraction will not occur. So that was a brief overview of the process of cardiac excitation contraction coupling, but it is important that this process is able to be regulated by the body. One example of this is adrenaline. During the fight or flight response, the body releases adrenaline. This acts on beta-1 adrenoceptors on cardiomyocytes. Beta-1 adrenoceptors are GS-coupled proteins, meaning they activate adrenaline cyclase. There will be more on G-protein coupled receptors in my upcoming video on these, which I'll provide the link for below once it's been uploaded. So, adenyl cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP, which activates protein kinase A. This enzyme goes on to open ryanodine receptors, decreasing the length of time that calcium causes contraction. It also opens L-type calcium channels, increasing the amount of calcium that enters the cell. This occurs in the SA node, and together, these produce shorter and more frequent heartbeats known as abbreviated contraction, the main way in which the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate. This is in complete contrast with the regulation by the parasympathetic nervous system. In this rest and digest state, acetylcholine is released and activates muscarinic M2 receptors on cardiomyocytes. These receptors are GI coupled, meaning they do the complete opposite of beta-1 adrenoceptors. They inhibit adenyl cyclase. This means protein kinase A will not evoke abbreviated contraction. Adrenaline and acetylcholine constantly work against each other to maintain an appropriate heart rate. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to support this channel so I'm able to keep creating this content. I'll be back soon with more pharmacology videos.